Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be with you all. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah wa alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa We begin in the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful. We praise him and we beseech him to send his peace and blessings upon all of his prophets and messengers. Noah, Abraham, David, Jesus, Moses, Muhammad, peace be upon them all. And the family and companions of our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And those that follow them in righteousness. Uh, I was enjoying what Imam Abdullah was speaking about because he speaks about Malcolm from a very unique vantage point. And he actually, you know, reached out to me on um, Monday and after his usual trash talk, uh, you know, sending me a son dunking. Uh, and, and I had to remind him that I beat his son in basketball one on one almost two years ago and I'll never play him again because you got to quit while you're ahead. So. Uh, mashallah, dunk in the goal. He said, you know, what are you going to talk about? I said, I'm going to talk about Malcolm. So he started coordinating. I said, listen, whatever you talk about, I'm just going to build on and it'll be complimentary. And lo and behold, he ended off with the exact theme that I wanted to focus on tonight, which is the burden of Malcolm's sincerity. The burden of Malcolm's sincerity. We start from an Islamic place, from a traditional place. If you open a book of a collection of the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, you will often find that the very first hadith, the first tradition that Islamic scholars and sages would choose to start with is actions are but by intention. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ bidniyat. Actions are but by intention. That it is your intention that truly counts in the sight of God. You may not achieve what you intend. You may achieve great material success with the wrong intentions, and what will count in the sight of God is what you intended, your sincerity. And another tradition, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says, also in the famous 40 hadith, he said that religion is sincerity. And we said, to whom, O Messenger of God? He said, sincerity to God, sincerity to his messenger, sincerity to the leaders, and sincerity to the lay people. Religion is sincerity. And Malcolm was burdened by his sincerity. You will find in the life of this man that he never takes the easy way out. He always chooses, not the more difficult course, but the one that he finds his heart to be in greater harmony with. And this shapes Malcolm's personal life. It shapes his politics. It shapes his religious pursuits. It shapes his alliances. It shapes every single sphere of his life. And I want us to appreciate for a moment that sincerity is not the recognition of truth. Many people recognize the truth, but they recognize the truth and articulate that recognition behind closed doors, at the dinner table, when they are in the comfort of their secure social spaces, but they don't articulate it in a place where it's consequential. Sincerity is commitment to that truth. And it shows in the zeal of that commitment and the willingness to face consequences as a result of that commitment. So it's not just the recognition of truth. Many of the things that Malcolm said were self-evident, especially to black people in America that lived the nightmare that he was speaking about. But it was the sincerity of Malcolm to that truth, his commitment and his willingness to face the consequences of that commitment. And you know, when you talk about sincerity and you talk about being an empath, Malcolm was essentially an empath. And one of the things that's very beautiful, if you look at the picture of Malcolm as a child and you look at his eyes, you can already see that sincerity. There is a beauty that immediately penetrates the soul. You can tell the man was sincere. And in fact, some of Malcolm as they look at even his childhood and even his lowest points will note that, for example, Malcolm was never involved in violent crime, though he had the opportunity to because Malcolm did not believe in inflicting pain upon people. And this stands in such contradiction with the image of Malcolm that has been intentionally cast in American textbooks and in the public space as a man who was militant from the very start and whose militancy pushed him to a place of evil and a place of wanting to inflict harm on people. Who did Malcolm hurt? 
in his entire life. Even in his lowest days, Malcolm abstained from violent crime. Malcolm was not a man who wanted to hurt anybody. Malcolm was a man that constantly faced disappointment as a child and was confronted by the ugly realities, politically, socially, economically, of what it was like to be amongst his people. Now, here's the thing about the empath. An empath will suffer in this life, by necessity, greater than your average individual. Why? Because an empath carries not just the burden of the difficulties that come by nature to the individual, but the empath chooses to carry the burdens of others. Malcolm was always an empath. His entire life, when you hear him speak about his childhood and the pain that he carried of his mother, the pain that he carried of his father, the pain that he carried of his people. Yes, at times he acted in ways that were not productive and that even undermined perhaps that sincerity, but Malcolm was always an empath. And sincere people will often suffer due to the lack of a sincere reception from those that are around them. And Malcolm would suffer his entire life because his sincerity would not be matched. And so at some points he's disappointed by the difficulties that come, the burdens that come with being who he was in the society. And at times he would feel betrayed by the lack of perceived sincerity of those around him to a cause that he so truly not just believed in, but was willing to die for. And it's very interesting because when you study the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his greatest trait, what he was known by, was a sadiq al-amin, the honest one, the trustworthy one. Meaning the enemies of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, could not accuse him of being insincere. They could not accuse him of being a fraud. They couldn't accuse him of lying. With all the accusations that they tried to throw his way, they had to attribute their rejection to his message, to some sort of supernatural. They said he's a madman, he's lost his mind, he's a sorcerer, he's a magician. But they couldn't call him a liar because his entire life had already proven that he was incapable of being a liar. And what did the greatest enemies of Malcolm X say about him? They said that we know he's sincere. We know he's sincere. You couldn't question his sincerity. And Malcolm actually said, that he wants to be remembered, and we remember him today as such, as a man who was sincere even when he made mistakes, who was unquestionable in his sincerity. It drove the FBI crazy. It drove the FBI crazy that they couldn't find dirt on this man. Tapping his phones, infiltrating his meetings, getting into his closest inner circles, agitating even amongst his family. They could not find a speck on Malcolm, anything to taint him with domestically or abroad. They couldn't find a financial transaction that they could hold over him. They couldn't accuse him of infidelity. They couldn't accuse Malcolm of being money or power hungry. They couldn't find anything. They said the man's like a saint. And so even as they were trying to carry out a witch hunt that would ultimately discredit Malcolm, they were flustered by Malcolm, as they were getting more and more exposed to him, he was too sincere for them. And it didn't make much sense. And that sincerity always put him in a bind. So when you look at Malcolm in prison, you know, it's really interesting because if you go to the prison system, you'll find that many people will find hope in the autobiography of Malcolm X in a way that they will not find it in anything else. The autobiography of Malcolm X gets circulated around the prison system more than any holy book. And it brings about in people a renewed sense of hope because they see that if he could become that, then maybe I have that path as well. Now, Malcolm didn't choose the easy route in prison, right? He ended up getting called Satan, as Imam Abdullah just spoke about, because Malcolm challenged. And he challenged, and he challenged. He refused to simply accept things as he was supposed to accept them. So he challenged the preachers. And yes, Malcolm challenged the other prisoners as well. And yes, Malcolm was 
very difficult to deal with when it came to the prison guards. Malcolm refused to simply acquiesce. He had to figure it out on his own and he had to live his own. And what Malcolm does coming out of prison is also a testimony to his sincerity. Many people commit to live up to higher truths should they get out of their lowest moments. Malcolm actually made good on that, came out of prison and immediately dedicated himself to the nation of Islam as he saw that as the route of truth at the time and he became its most sincere caller and sincere servant, devoted to that mission, devoted to that message, going around the country, establishing temples because he thought that was the right thing to do. That was the most sincere thing that he could be doing at the time. This message saved my life. I wanted to save as many people's lives as possible because it saved me. This message brought me out of the lowest point as an individual. I believe this message can bring collective growth to people. I believe that it can rescue people as societies, as communities. And so I'm going to go around the country and expose people to this truth the way it was exposed to me. And he was relentless in that pursuit. His sincerity blinded him to an extent because he did not want to see any flaws in what seemed so pure to him when it came to him. Because to do so may chip away at his zeal. It might have chipped away at his courage. So he tried not to see it, not because he was insincere, but because he did not want anything to undercut his passion and that sincere commitment to this truth. And so he's going around the country establishing temples. He's going around the country exposing the nation of Islam to black people around this country. And throughout that process, Malcolm never gets rich. Malcolm does not do this for financial gain. Malcolm makes it a point to attribute even his brilliance to his leader so that he would not be considered the source of that brilliance, though many times he was. So on the fly, he would say, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us this and that, and it really was Malcolm teaching himself something of brilliance. But in his sincerity, he didn't even want to be attributed, or he didn't want that brilliance to be attributed to him. And so he negated himself as the source, put himself in financial strain, put himself at odds with other civil rights leaders at the time. Now that was from a place of sincerity. And in some cases, he would be the first one to tell you he was wrong. But Malcolm was sincere. And many of you, as you read the story of Malcolm X, would say that you know his split with the nation of Islam came as a result of an isolated thing. And you'll start to read about you know, some of the scandalizing or some of the scandals that arose in the private life of the, uh, of, of the messenger. But many of those that were close to Malcolm actually said the very first crack in that relationship was actually the police murder of a man by the name of Ronald Stokes. If you read about Ronald Stokes, it's, an, it's, it's very interesting because many of those closest to Malcolm said this is actually where the split from the Nation of Islam starts with Malcolm. Ronald Stokes was a member of the Nation of Islam in Los Angeles who was murdered by the police along with other members of the Nation of Islam. And Malcolm was enraged by that police brutality. And Malcolm wanted to take a greater stand against that police killing of Ronald Stokes. And when he was told not to publicly speak, not to go to Los Angeles, not to involve himself in some of these police brutality protests, Malcolm saw a crack in that purpose. Malcolm felt like he was betraying his conscience. And he couldn't. And that's actually where the split starts to happen. Because Malcolm saw that which betrayed his purpose. And so it starts with Ronald Stokes. And then when he sees the personal indiscretions, that also chips away and forces an identity crisis of sorts with Malcolm. Now here's the thing. Much of what is happening in the life of Malcolm, the turmoil, 
is not organic. It is, in fact, instigated because the FBI at the time has no interest in seeing Orthodox Islam win over the Nation of Islam because of any creedal uh, supremacy. They have an interest in paralyzing any potent black movement in America. So that a lot of this is inorganic. A lot of it is certainly turmoil that's first forced from the outside. But what you find in Malcolm is a sincere desire to constantly find the truth and then a willingness to commit himself to that truth. And that gives him pause and also makes him a lot of enemies in the process. And he often feels alone. You know, it's interesting. Malcolm in 1964 was the most sought out speaker on college campuses in the entirety of the United States of America. But if you read Malcolm's diary, that's when he felt most alone. He felt estranged. He felt alienated. Because while Malcolm was speaking to larger audiences, he found that the circle of people around him that were as committed to that truth as he was, was shrinking. And that bothered him. Now, it's very interesting because after Ronald Stokes, the creedal evolution of Malcolm, because this sincerity shaped everything about him, Malcolm talked about when he was going around university campuses and speaking, he said at one campus after the other, and he writes about this in his autobiography, I was confronted by Muslim students that would confront me on certain doctrines of the nation of Islam that I didn't feel like you know, were, were, were true, and that they were able to poke holes in, and he would resort to the same few lines over and over again, but Malcolm felt insincere because he... He knew that if he was truly a student and truly a man who was seeking the purest meaning of those texts that he was preaching with such undeniable passion that he would seek out the most authentic interpretation of them. And so he says, I'm getting you know, uh, confronted by Muslim student after Muslim student on different campuses. And he said, then I came to Imam Wallace Dean Muhammad, Warith Dean Muhammad, rahimahullah, the son of Elijah Muhammad. And I asked him what I should do if I should learn more. And he told me, and Malcolm writes about this in his autobiography, that if you are sincere to your religion, then you should learn as much of it as you can. Don't stunt your growth. Don't stunt your intellectual growth. No, learn more. Grow. Nothing should stop you from growing in your knowledge of the religion. And the more that Malcolm learned, the more that he found himself, once again, alienated. Now, Malcolm carries many burdens. He still is sincerely committed to the upliftment of black people in America in a way that does not reduce him to a singular plight, but rather keeps him grounded in his initial plight. You see, Malcolm was the first one to include Vietnam in the discourse. He's the first one to talk about Palestine in the discourse. Malcolm brings about many of these international issues, connecting the black man in America to many international uh, struggles and plights, but he never forgets the plight that grounded him. And as he's growing in his devotion, his sincere devotion, religiously, he doesn't want to abandon that plight. And it's really interesting because you read in his diary, Malcolm writes about the supplication that he made on Arafah, on Mount Arafat, which is, of course, the peak moment of supplication in the Hajj pilgrimage, where the pilgrim stands out in the open on the plain of Arafah and looks up to God and supplicates God for six, seven hours under the hot sun with no interruption. The only ritual that day is sincere supplication. And the only window that Malcolm gives you into that supplication he says, I swore to Allah that I would eliminate racism from the American Muslim movement when I got back. He said, on Mount Arafat, I swore to Allah that I would eliminate racism from the American Muslim movement. Meaning he wanted to come back and reconcile with the nation of Islam and eliminate what he saw as a stain that could be removed and the good of that movement could still be salvaged if it would meet the sincerity of that enlightened understanding that Malcolm had based upon the most authentic expressions of Islam. If it was able to adjust and take on that orthodoxy, but still maintain the commitment to the aggrieved, 
then it could be as potent as ever. And Malcolm wished that he could come back and reconcile and we could keep it moving. And he thought that maybe I could still work with people and we could keep it moving. But that's the only dua, the only supplication he lets you in on. In those hours of supplication, when he was on Arafah, calling to God alone. Malcolm's sincerity is also that even after his split from the nation of Islam, Malcolm does not choose the most convenient option to him then either. There are many times that he could have chosen a more convenient route. There are many people that wanted Malcolm to abandon his adherence to Islam altogether. I want you to think about this. From a worldly perspective, Malcolm gets no benefit by being the one Muslim, the one Sunni Muslim on the circuit. He gets no benefit. If he wants to now integrate into mainstream civil rights work, he either abandons the religion altogether, he abandons anything that's going to be a barrier between him and some of the other articulate leaders of the movement, but he chooses to adhere to his most authentic pursuits. And he graduates in his understanding of Islam rather than abandoning it altogether and he doesn't take the most convenient option to him. Had Malcolm simply walked away from the nation of Islam and walked back into something that was more familiar to the American public and to the leaders of the plight of African Americans, Malcolm would have found greater acceptance, but he didn't do that because it was inauthentic. And even if you can't appreciate Malcolm's conclusion, you can still appreciate his sincerity to that conclusion that he didn't just walk back into the most convenient option. Malcolm sought to reconcile with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. after he had said some pretty distasteful things about him. Malcolm wanted black leaders to work with each other and he wanted to lend his support. But even then, with a new tone, with more maturity, he still would articulate his differences with the philosophy, the political philosophy of Dr. King, but with a sense of love and saying this should not stop us from working together and building coalition. He didn't simply abandon all of his political principles now because it was no longer convenient to a standing in the nation of Islam. He still had a very unique political philosophy. He still had a very articulate philosophy. He was still able to articulate different strategies and to say that the difference between I and Dr. King now is one of strategy. It's still there, but we're still brothers that can be working towards the common plight. And then Malcolm sends a letter to the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> this is actually incredible. If you read the telegrams of Malcolm X, who is one of the most vulnerable people in America, in June 1964, the man's house is being attacked. He has death threat after death threat. He doesn't have the force of the nation behind him. And he's writing letters to the Ku Klux Klan threatening them if they harm Dr. King, and writing a letter of solidarity to Dr. King in prison, saying that I will have your back if they attack you. And then he makes good on that promise and goes down to Selma without the force of the nation of Islam, puts himself in the midst of it. And in his sincerity, what does he do? He actually embraces being the villain. He says to Dr. King's people who were very skeptical of him that if they see me come here and they see me speak, they will be forced to work with Dr. King because they'll see me as the scarier alternative. And so he uses this ambiguous language in Selma where he says, give Dr. King what he's asking you for or else. But he never tells you what the or else is. And so he says, let me be that scary alternative. Let me be the sacrifice here. I don't need to be celebrated. I don't want to be hoisted here. I'm here to support Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And he does. You know what Dr. Coretta Scott King would say? She said, I only met him once. And there's that iconic meeting between the two. But his warmth and his sincerity was so evident. She cited his sincerity. It was so clear. He wasn't here to undermine anything. He wasn't here to claim the pulpit. He wasn't here to get the spotlight on him. He was here to lend his support because he cared about the movement. His sincerity was his willingness to be that sacrifice. His sincerity was his willingness to not be accepted in the mainstream, but to be that scary alternative if that meant a better political positioning for his people. And his sincerity religiously was his commitment to 
this faith. And this is actually, you know, such a beautiful thing about him. That Malcolm never did anything in a half-hearted way. When he decides to learn this faith, and one of the things that he does with Islam, by the way, is he articulates exactly how it was congruent with every other sincere principle that he held in his life. You see, Malcolm did not believe in the dream of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. because he was living the American nightmare. But then when he went to Hajj, he saw the potential of Dr. King's dream through the lens, through the frame of a tradition that was before that foreign to him. Dr. King talked about young white girls and black girls integrated, you know, uh, treating each other like full human beings. He talked about that day. Malcolm saw it in Hajj. And not just the complexity of black and white from one region, but a ritual that united people across race, across social, political, economic circumstance and made everyone truly equal before the sight of God and people serving each other and working together in that capacity. Malcolm saw what he thought was impossible before that. So he articulated how his sincere faith was congruent to his sincere political ideas and his sincere societal beliefs. And here's something that I'll, that I'll share with you, by the way. Malcolm, when he comes back from Mecca, he says that one of the conclusions that he had was that the white man was not inherently evil, but it was the societal, political, and economic forces of America that prompted white people to act in an evil way. And he said that white supremacy was a psychology. It was a psychology that was nourished by an evil environment and that you had to solve the poisons that existed in that society to bring out the best of people. And that if people actually reframed themselves in light of their relationship with their creator and their relationship with each other, one God who sent many prophets and created many peoples, then they would be able to walk away from what lured them towards that evil in the first place. So Malcolm saw something about society and he saw the potential of man as well. Now as you go further, you'll also see that Malcolm, and I'll, I'll conclude with this, had many opportunities to abandon his call towards the end of his life. He had many opportunities to find safety. Malcolm knew very well that he was going to be assassinated. And he didn't want a civil war. Malcolm chose that route of being sacrificed because he didn't want a shootout. He didn't want his, his guards to be armed that day. He didn't want people shooting at each other. He didn't want the image, even in his death. He didn't want to feed the FBI and the other forces that were at play the image that they wanted of black people killing each other and the movement collapsing from within. In fact, Malcolm was very hesitant to even articulate what he had seen within the nation of Islam, the indiscretions. And he talked about how he was so hesitant to even speak about this publicly because Malcolm did not want to paralyze that movement. And what you'll find is that Malcolm in his very, very last days talks about how lonely he was. You know, it's actually really sad because you read his diary and you'll, and you'll keep seeing that word, alone, alone, even in his uh, trips to Europe. He takes walks outside and he says he felt alone. Malcolm went from having brothers to being estranged. And it was a small group of people around him that affirmed him in his pursuit and commitment to that truth. But that's the burden of sincerity. You know, he used to start every single lecture of his with, Assalamu alaikum, peace be unto you. And God so decreed that his last words would be coming to the podium and saying, Assalamu alaikum for the very last time, peace be unto you, before he was martyred. That that's how Malcolm lived in this world. And as Ozzie Davis would say in his eulogy, who did not hesitate to die because he loved us so. He didn't have any hesitation to even make that greater sacrifice because he had such a love and such a sincerity and such a passion that put him in that way. And so what do we take from that? 
Number one, beyond the life and legacy of Malcolm X, Al Hajj Malik al Shabazz, Rahimahullah. Sincerity. Sincerity. Malcolm did not have the tools of greatness, but he had a sincerity that allowed him to surpass even those who had every tool at their disposal. It was sincerity. Malcolm had a commitment to that truth. Malcolm was willing to make sacrifices for that truth. And Malcolm sought from God that truth and matched it every step along the way and constantly tried to help people around him. I mean, that burden of sincerity was strong in the life of Malcolm. Until today. You go to the grave of Malcolm X, you won't find the fanfare around it. It's actually, you know, stunning that it's in the suburbs of New York, the cemetery of Malcolm X. There's no museum around it. There's no, nothing around it. I mean, you have to actually find it. And I tell people, when you go to LaGuardia Airport, let's go ahead and search the cemetery where Malcolm lays and he and his wife, Betty Shabazz, share one stone in the grounds. And Malcolm was okay with that because he didn't want the glory in this world. He wanted something greater. So it was the sincerity and the passion and that commitment to the truth that Malcolm had, his willingness to make those sacrifices, the sacrifices that were necessary in the process. And it is the desire that he had for other people to live with that same commitment that we see people inspired by him until today, even though he is vilified over and over and over again and erased from the history books you can't make him irrelevant because he was just that great. May Allah have mercy on him and allow us to follow in his path. Assalamu alaikum.